Hello and welcome to the very first edition of Crime Talk. Uh, my name is Colin Beaumont and I'm going to be your host. Uh, what is Crime Talk? Well, it's going to be um, a legal forum, a legal discussion um, in which we get to grips with current legal topics of relevance to criminal lawyers, uh, but we also uh, want to widen uh, the discussion so that we can have guests and discuss other matters of interest that are topical in the area of criminal law. My first guest will be Hadi Al Dinsa, who at the moment is the Deputy Police and Crime Commissioner for the County of Derbyshire. Um, he's decided, um, having seen the way the boss does the job, uh, that he could do it just as well and therefore he's going to be the Labour Party candidate uh, for the post of Commissioner um, and no doubt he'll be um, standing in the forthcoming elections. Now, as far as um, Hardy Ali is concerned, uh, we'll be talking about the role of the Police and Crime Commissioner. Um, I suspect the vast majority of the population at large are quite unfamiliar uh, with that role. We'll be looking at his priorities um, upon being elected, um, assuming he is going to be elected. And of course, uh, we're going to consider what he uh, considers the budget uh, should actually be spent on. Um, I know that one of his um, main concerns is in relation to the safety of the people of Derbyshire. He's also going to um, tell us what attributes that he can bring uh, to the position that presumably uh, would not be brought um, by those people who are also standing. So that should be an interesting chat. I'm looking forward to meeting him. Now, let me get this right. At the moment, you're the Deputy Police and Crime Commissioner for the County of Derbyshire. Right. I right. was till the 6th of April. Right. I have to resign because yes. I'm now formally the candidate for the Labour Party for the Police and Crime Comm Commission elections. Yes, I was going to say that um, having seen how the job's done by the yeah. boss, you've decided, well, you could do that. Yeah, so well, you've put yourself up for election. That's right. Three and a half years as Deputy to Alan Charles, the first Police and Crime Commissioner for Derbyshire. I think I've learned the ropes, yes. done the job, yes. I'm ready to step up to be the Police and Crime Commissioner for Derbyshire. Right, and you're the um, Labour Party um, candidate really for the post. That's right. Right. Now, I think it's fair to say that most people are not really familiar with the role of the um, Police and Crime police and crime con Commissioner, so perhaps you'd like to just explain briefly what your role is. Okay. First of all, policing has always had governance and scrutiny. So for many years now, there's been a police authority committee which has elected councillors, justices of the peace and uh, independent members who form a management committee that scrutinised and governed policing in Derbyshire. That has been replaced by an elected individual yes. called the Police and Crime Commissioner. Right. And that is the main difference. Yes. Um, so um, this came about because the government felt that the police authority was a non-entity, bureaucratic, backroom organisation which did not have connection with local communities and neighbourhoods and was not accountable directly to the public. Elected police and crime commissioners are there to do that and their role is to uh, hold the chief constable to account to deliver the police and uh, crime plan priorities which are set by the police and crime commissioner and who also sets the precept and the budget that's allocated to the Chief Constable to deliver policing in Derbyshire. Right. Now, since then, the government has strengthened the role to not just scrutinise on governance uh, policing, but also commission victim services. So since October 2014, commis uh, police and crime commissioners are responsible for commissioning generic victim services and specialist services such as domestic and sexual violence and hate crime and other areas like restorative justice and we are also looking to commission in Derbyshire uh, young people's advocacy service. Right, okay, would you, um, would you agree with me that when the role was first mooted uh, there was quite a bit of opposition uh, to the role being introduced as Police and Crime Commissioner. Um, a lot of people thinking, well, is this just another layer of bureaucracy? Do we really need a Police and Crime Commissioner? Do you think that feeling is still prevalent or do you think, as it were, the role is becoming more acceptable and better known? Well, we've been doing um, surveys, what, what we say, have your say. And yes. we go around the whole of all the neighbourhoods and communities in Derbyshire uh, consulting 
those individuals and citizens of Derbyshire to ask them what they think of policing. Yes. We've also been asking the question, do they know who their police and crime commissioner is? Yes. And I can tell you that there's been an increased awareness and understanding of what the role of the police and crime commissioner is. For example, uh, the last year's survey indicated that uh, people will know their MP, 50% of their people, uh, uh, citizens know who their MP is, 36% yes. knew who their police and crime commissioner wow. is. So that's an improvement yeah. from what happened previously. Yeah. Those are higher figures than I would have expected, yeah. quite frankly. And I, I've no idea who my police and crime commissioner is. Right. Well, I can tell you who he is, but uh, <laughs> um, he should do a bit more work then, I yes. think. Um, one of the things which is a misconception that this is an additional bureaucratic uh, process being put in place, it's not. What's happened is that a, a, a governance structure called the police authority has been replaced by an individual yes. that is democratically elected by the people of uh, the local people yes. as the police and crime commission. So you have effectively replaced a committee? Yes. I think um, the public at large would be quite pleased that an elected individual has replaced an unelected committee. Yes, and I think if you talk to chief constables and the policing world and the wider criminal justice world, they also have found it more effective, more efficient, and um, in terms of bureaucratic um, um, deficiencies have been removed yes. so that the decision-making process is speedier and more focused. Right. Do you have the ultimate power to suspend or remove a chief constable? Yes, the Police and Crime Commissioner in effect employs the Chief Constable to deliver, operationally deliver, police and crime issues in Derbyshire. Yeah. And if that individual is not doing the job properly, my view is that first of all you have a robust and constructive relationship and dialogue with the individual yes. to actually improve the delivery of uh, policing, yes. but if that's not possible, I think you have to consider whether you want somebody else to take up the job and actually deliver the service that are required for the people of Derbyshire. Yeah, it's a very draconian step and hopefully most of the time the working relationship will be a good one yes. um, and it won't come to that. And professional people will always work out a way of actually delivering services and not take draconian steps. Yeah. And please don't take this the wrong way, but um, who judges the judges? Who has the power to remove you? Right, the or should the I say the commissioner? Yeah, the commissioner is elected by the people of Derbyshire yeah. and the commissioner can be deselected by the people of Derbyshire at the term end. So yes. there's four year term for police and crime commissioners, right. there has to be elections and in that election the people of Derbyshire vote to decide who their future police and crime commissioner is. But what if the people of Derbyshire decided after say a year that because of the unacceptable behaviour of a particular commissioner, who would then have the decision as to whether or not that person should be removed early? I mean that's been a um, uh, point of debate, yeah. as, is, as it has been for par par members of Parliament. Yeah, yeah. So my view is that the same principle should apply to police and crime commissioners yeah. as they do and should do for par uh, parliamentarians. Yes. So for example, um, if, if it's a question of uh, policies and um, views, that's something that can't be uh, used as a reason to remove no, somebody. No. But if they have been professionally or ethically yes. uh, not undertaking their job as required, yes. then there should be a mechanism for yes. challenging their behaviour yes. and their ethics and their unprofessionalism in carrying out the job yes. of a police and crime commissioner. Yes. Do you think that the decisions of the commissioner are ultimately reviewable in the High Court by way of judicial review? Could that be the challenge uh, against one of your decisions? Um, I don't think so. I think, uh, as, as with parliamentarians, yes. there are codes and ethics that every uh, police and crime commissioner has to sign up to. Right. And if they are um, broken yes. or they've committed a criminal offence which causes an impact on the role, then those are the sort of standards that should be applied. I don't think we need to reinvent something different for police and crime commissioners. Yes. We need to use the common sense and um, historical development of uh, challenging parliamentarians, members of parliament, members of the European Parliament, and the same um, uh, rules should apply to police and crime commissioners. What do you think the voter turnout is going to be? Have you any idea of, of the percentage of people you expect to participate? I know we talk a lot, don't we, about voter apathy. 
Yeah. I mean, last time uh, there was a 14.3% turnout in yeah. Derbyshire. How uh, very low indeed. Yeah. yeah. There is more awareness, but still, I think people are still wanting to know what is this all about. Yes. And it's my job and everybody's job to actually make sure that people do know and that they can take part in this election. Yeah. My personal view is that if it goes to 20% or 25%, we will be doing really very well. Yes, yes. Now, in relation to crime generally, I pick up the newspaper one day, crime is down. Yeah? I pick up the newspaper the next day, crime is up. What's the truth of it? Is crime up or down? Can we sleep easier in our beds at night in Derbyshire? Right. In terms of over the last 10 years, crime, which has been measured, the, the basket of measured crime that the government has been using as their indicator, that crime has gone down. There's been a 50% reduction in crime of those uh, uh, typical crimes which are measured by government right. to measure performance. Yes. There's been a 50% reduction. So there's been 50,000 less victims in Derbyshire in the last 10 years. However, I don't think crime is going down overall mm -hmm. because some areas of crime have never been measured. Right. For example, cyber crime, online uh, fraud and uh, uh, child sexual exploitation, some of the uh, the new hidden crimes which have come out from sexual and domestic abuse, uh, the Savile um, uh, inquiry and uh, scandal, all these areas yes. are producing new areas of crime. So I would say crime is not going down, crime is changing yes. and we need to have the resources and the ability of professionals to tackle those new emerging crimes yes. which have been hidden in the past. Yes. Which really brings me to the budget. To what extent are you in control of the budget? Is that part of your remit? Yes. yes. Uh, well, yes and no. The part of the budget which is um, uh, a grant from, poli uh, from government uh, is one half, uh, or, or more than one half in Derbyshire, and the other is what is raised by the Police and Crime Commissioner through the precept council tax. So, in Derbyshire, 66% is a government grant, and the, the remainder is actually raised by the Police and Crime Commissioner through a precept. So the, the Police and Crime Commissioner has to make a judgment every year in terms of whether to increase that precept, to keep it the same or reduce it based on what the demands are and what government funds. So if government, which has been doing for the last five years, reducing funding for policing, uh, by uh, 24, 25,000 pounds, mm. that means the Police and Crime Commissioner has to decide whether he needs to make that up by increasing the precept yes. or make, um, uh, allow the people of Derbyshire to have le less resources for policing. Yes. A yes. difficult decision to be made. C can, we, um, can we talk about what your priorities would be in the event of being elected? Um, I'm particularly concerned with the area of safety. I think the average person in Derbyshire um, is clearly concerned about the possibility of being mugged in the street. Uh, they're concerned about dwelling house burglary. Um, they're concerned about people misusing Class A drugs and all the social problems attached to that. They're probably not so much concerned, I might be wrong, but they're probably not so much concerned with sort of white collar or cyber crime. Now, my question really for you is, how would you prioritise it in terms of making sure that the people of Derbyshire are safe? Because I think safety is an important consideration when you're tackling crime. I know, I know personally there are areas of crime that don't concern me. What concerns me most is that I'm safe within the community. Yeah. Um, I mean, very, very good question. And it's, the answer is not going to be a simple one, I'm no. afraid. Um, safety is number one as my priority um, and my view is that victims are at the heart of everything I'm, I do yeah. and every decision I make and uh, one of the jobs of the police and crime commissioner is to set a police and crime plan, plan which uh, responds to all the priorities and the demands. So first of all we have to take account of the uh, chief constable and the professionals t telling us where the risk and threat is greatest and that will be in place in, in situations like for example organized crime 
domestic violence, sexual violence, hate crime, um, and also in areas where uh, you need uh, international terrorism response, counterterrorism. So the strategic national priorities, actually helping other parts where there's major incidences, those are areas that have to be covered. And it's the job of the Police and Crime Commissioner that enough resources, appropriate proportionate resources are made available for those cases that need to be dealt with for the protection of the country and the citizens as a whole. You're right though, the general person in the street will not see or hear about those sort of things because that won't impact them on everyday life. Mm. So we need to also be able to respond to those things that concern people, the majority of people, and they may not be serious risk threats, but they are important to those individuals living in Derbyshire. So for example, um, burglaries, um, car theft, uh, antisocial behavior, car parking, um, dog fouling, mm. these are the sort of things that actually impact on people's quality of life. Mm. And I am very interested and concerned about how I can contribute towards improving the quality of life of individuals living in Derbyshire. So we need to have a balance between making sure that the serious um, major threats, which could be through the whole country and to Derbyshire citizens, are well resourced, but we also want to make sure that we actually respond to the concerns which give better confidence to um, citizens living in Derbyshire. Yeah. But I do have to give you this one example. Safety is not all it seems. For example, uh, visible police policing is, has been seen as a very important barometer of uh, people feeling safe. Yes. So for example, imagine the scene, mum and dad sitting in their front room watch the a police officer go by their street yes. and they say oh that's really good yes. we feel safe yes however their 12 year old daughter is in the bedroom on the on the computer and being groomed by an individual who is 45 years old mm. and a, possibly a pedophile perpetrator mm. pretending to be a young girl befriending her and that that is also part of making people safe mm. now mum and dad might feel assured by a police officer walking down the street, yes. but that won't stop the uh, victimization of their daughter in their own house and bedroom. Yes. So we need police officers who are visible not only on the streets, but on the internet and other hidden areas of crime. So in that situation, a police officer sitting with t-shirt and jeans in behind a computer chasing those criminals are, are equally important to the safety of the citizens of Derbyshire as a police officer walking by, stopping burglaries and um, car thefts. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, what do you think about restorative justice? I know that um, it's, very, um, it's a very in concept at the moment. Um, do you think that the average person in the street though would regard restorative justice not being charged, not having to go through the criminal justice system as the perpetrator effectively having got away with it? Right. I mean firstly I've got 30 years experience working in the criminal justice system. Yeah. I've been a probation officer and a manager covering all aspects of the criminal justice system and restorative justice has always been seen as a very effective way of actually um, helping victims to resolve the crime that they were um, uh, at the receiving end of mm -hmm. and offenders to better understand the impact they make on uh, victims yes. of their crimes. And uh, evidence research shows that um, it has a positive impact if done professionally by accredited practitioners. Now, in policing, restorative justice has been used for a narrow area of work. And you mentioned uh, somebody getting restorative justice as opposed to being convicted and charged. Yes. And that's why the police have been using across the country for the last four or five years what's called out of court restorative justice. In my view, that was what police officers did for a long, long time, which is community resolutions. They come across an incident or a, um, uh, within the communities, they see what's going on, they resolve the situation to the satisfaction of the uh, victim and the perpetrator, alleged perpetrator, and they send the people on their way. Restorative justice should not be replacing charging and convictions. 
If somebody's committed a crime, they must be dealt with by the full force of the law. Mm. Restorative justice, in the way that uh, is professionally credited, can be delivered out of court, post court, and post conviction, and even somebody being released from prison. And that is a sy system that we have commissioned in Derbyshire, and uh, all police and crime commissioners are commissioning restorative justices to help victims to um, come to terms and recover from their victimization and for offenders to better understand the Im negative impact of their offending mm. and therefore stop offending. Mm. Used in that professional way, restorative justice can actually add and contribute to making the people of Derbyshire safer. What about prisons? Do you think that we need more prisons or do you think that as a society uh, we lock up more people than just about any other country in Europe? Yeah. More or less? Fewer or more? Yeah. I mean, I, I, as I say, I have worked as a probation officer. I've worked uh, uh, in the prison system as well. Majority of people who are sent to prison are people who are not uh, what you call professional criminals. They are people who, are, who have been um, on the wrong side of the law uh, or are, have got other challenges, difficulties, where, whether it's employment, accommodation, mental health related issues, uh, alcohol, drug addictions, and they need help to sort those problems out. Because if they don't, mm. they will continue to keep coming back into prison, yes. being convicted yes. through what's called the revolving draw mechanism. Yes. And we can do more about prevention and rehabilitation and reintegration so that we actually have less people in our prisons because prison doesn't always work. No. Do you think that resources need to be targeted at this particular group whereby when they're released from prison they're given some sort of help and assistance whereby they don't fall back into their criminal ways? I mean that is the, one of the biggest challenges. That is exactly what needs to be done mm. um, because locking somebody up and throwing away the key mm. will not help society. You need to help that individual to come to terms with their offending to accept what they've done wrong, but also to be helped to be enabled to cope better with the life's challenges so that they don't fall into foul criminal behavior. Yes. And I think to do that, you need to focus resources on reintegration back into communities of offenders, because yes. if you don't do that, it'll they just be coming back and actually draining more resources actually yes. from the state and the criminal justice system and processes. Yes. What's your, what's your view on cautioning? I think the general public at large think that, again, a caution at the police station rather than being charged and put through the court process is a bit of a let-off. Uh, would you be in favour of fewer cautions being handed out? And I'm thinking here for particularly serious offences, like offences that are indictable only um, or offences that are tribal either way, um, I sometimes get the impression that the victim thinks, well, you know, I went to all the bother and the trouble of contacting the police and they've let him off with a caution. What sort of justice is that? Yeah. I mean, this is a question for the um, sentencing guidelines which are available to the, uh, the, the courts yes. and the police. Um, cautions are only to be used on first-time offences right. and low level. Mm. If somebody has committed an offence which is indictable uh, and uh, is uh, serious enough, they should be charged and convicted. Um, so I think the caution element should be done appropriately. Now, if, if that's been abused, yes. that has to be stopped. We must use c the whole criminal justice system and process for proportionate, um, uh, uh, relevant sentencing and uh, charging. Because we don't want people who should be convicted and we don't want victims feeling that they are grieved because somebody's done something wrong. Yes. They should be able to be at the heart of uh, policing and their views must be heard. Um, I want to ask you particularly about young people. It's my experience as a lawyer that once you start bringing young people into the criminal justice system, they tend to mix with other people and it's almost a slippery slope. Would you agree with me that really the criminal justice system should do everything possible to keep these young people out of the system for as long as possible? I totally agree with that. Um, uh, young people 
tend to go through a curve. Most people do get into trouble when they're young, and the majority of them actually grow out of it. Um, those that do get sucked into the criminal justice system are more likely to then stay there for a long time, mm. unless there are rehabilitation alternatives and early interventions which are brought into place. And I think that the youth offending services in, across the country have worked in partnership to do early intervention and early prevention. That has to be the key to make sure that young people who incidentally are more likely to be victims as much as perpetrators mm -hmm. need to be helped to um, be more confident in seeking support, whether it's uh, mental health services, emotional support, or with uh, employment and uh, accommodation issues. Because if you can help in those areas, the chances of them getting into trouble and getting sucked into the criminal justice system in a negative way increases. So I think we should do whatever we can, working in partnership, early interventions, both for young people who are being uh, attracted towards criminality and those who are victims mm. to get a better service. And on the latter, one of the things I've been doing as a Deputy Police and Crime Commissioner for the last year and a half is to look at to see how we can actually have better advocacy services for young people. And we've commissioned a service which will come into effect on the 1st of April, which means that young people who are unable to use mainstream sports services such as mental health services, uh, emotional services and employment services, we will look to see how we can actually enable them to access those services and find out where the gaps are and actually try to fill those gaps. Okay, M my next question is in relation to domestic violence. It seems to me that the magistrate's courts seem full of cases concerning domestic violence. Now, we've got this new system, haven't we, where on occasion a person can be issued with a domestic violence protection notice and then a domestic violence protection order to keep the person out of the home and to stop the person from molesting the other party. What are your views on these notices and orders rather than people being charged? Do you think they're a good thing? I think they're a good thing because they've added to the um, arsenal of um, uh, interventions that have been made available mm. to increase confidence for people to report domestic violence. Uh, one of the facts is that domestic violence it relates to one in ten crimes. Even that is, in my view, not enough. It's an area where I think there should be uh, more reporting and more recording of domestic violence crime because only a third of domestic violence is actually reported. So we need to increase the confidence of victims who are mo mo mainly women, but mm, now increasingly mm. men as well, mm. to be able to report their abuse. Because at the moment, it takes about 35 occasions of abuse before somebody uh, is forced to report it to anybody, never mind the police. Mm. And we need to work on that. So the domestic violence protection order yeah. and notice do help because on many occasions, when somebody is reluctant to report, they do need assistance. And those are additional ways of actually offering support yes. which can protect those victims until they feel confident to actually report to them thing and charge somebody. Yes, this is where the complainant effectively doesn't want to engage with the police for one yeah. reason or another. The police still have these powers under the notices and under the orders. Yeah. yeah. Uh, fi finally, what I'd say is um, thank you, obviously, uh, for, for having this interview. Um, in relation to the forthcoming election, no doubt you're optimistic of being elected. Um, can, I, can we just end on you um, effectively saying, what do you think that you would bring to the role um, that your opponents wouldn't bring? Yeah. I mean, I think the biggest thing I will bring is experience. I have 10 years experience in the police authority, which was the successor to the police and crime commissioners. I've been 30 years in the criminal justice system as a probation officer and a senior manager uh, looking at strategic delivery of services to stop crime and protect victims. I've led on commissioning uh, victim services for the police and crime commissioner. So I've got a wealth of experience of not only from my background as a professional, but also three and a half years as the deputy police and crime commissioner. So I've been able to do the job and actually know what he's doing. So uh, this job is not about police officers uh, running um, policing, it's governance and scrutiny. I have been undertaking that role throughout my life as a 
politician, as a senior politician, a cabinet member, as a professional for 30 years in the criminal justice system, and as the Deputy Police and Crime Commissioner for the last three and a half years. Hadi Odinza, thank you for coming on this edition of Crime Talk. Thank you.